All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. This is the Office 360. Oh, oh, I forgot to change the title slide. It's the Microsoft 365 wow. Productivity Tips. Yeah. We're going old school, Tom. We're talking about Office 365 Productivity Tips. <laughs> but it is the June Jam. And uh, so it's the, 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 I guess, the summer of love, the dance party that is life right now in quarantine. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's go with that. Uh, and how are you doing, Tom? Uh, it's kind of a off day. Found out that my dad's wife is basically in her final oh. days, if not hours. And I'm expecting a call at some point to say that she is no longer with us. So that's right. Kind of a kind of a down day and this is the second time he's had to do it because that happened with my mom 30 yeah. some odd years ago too with cancer and so you know it's one thing when you're 50 something and that happens it's another yeah. thing when you're like nearly 90 and trying to come back from that again I am fearing for him in addition to you know her passing away quietly and peacefully so yeah it's one of those kind of days not going for the sympathy vote here oh. just Way That's to set the tone, me. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, obviously, hey, that, that's uh, I mean, a serious thing. And, uh, you know, hey, prayers with you and your family, Tom. And, Thank you. And, uh, and of course, with, with you guys out there as well. And, and, uh, um, I, and I'll, uh, yeah, well, anyway, we'll have another conversation afterwards about my trip to Minnesota next month. So, yeah. Oh, okay. I uh, do have a call right after this, but yeah. I'll ping you when I get a chance. Yeah, talk. no worries. Um, so anyway, with all that out of the way, um, <laughs> thanks everybody for joining. Uh, and, uh, I think we've got some, uh, some good tips today. Um, just a, a lot that's going on in the tips world. Um, so uh, it's like my third tips session of this sort this month. Um, wow. I'm just promoting brand Tom in those other, uh, <laughs> sessions that I do. So. Yay me. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, for those that are joining for the first time, uh, if there's anybody out there, hopefully we got a bunch of repeat customers here, but, uh, quick introductions. I'm Christian Buckley. I run a company called collab talk. I'm based out of Lehigh, Utah, about 45 minutes South of Salt Lake city. Uh, and I'm a, uh, eight, almost hopefully nine time. We'll find out in a week in a week. Uh, whether I get renewed for a ninth time as an Office Apps and Services MVP and Microsoft Regional Director. And I have a blog called Buckley Planet, and that's me. And, and uh, Tom, over to you. I am a software engineer at Canby Health Solutions, which is based in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I actually live in Minnesota. Um, and I have a blog also, yay, <laughs> One Minute Office Magic, where if you go out there, you'll find a lot of these tips uh, that I post when I write them up usually once or twice a week. So feel free to go over there and join in. And what's great about this is that, so Tom and I've been doing this for three, three and a half years. I don't know how long it's been now, but well, I guess you can see on the next slide here, but we keep track, we keep score of all of these events. And right now, Tom is I again am the champion, dominating board. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tom's the most humble man that I know. Um, <laughs> there he is rubbing it in. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's amazing since we've been doing this since September of 2017, how close it is. Look at that. The total votes over those those three years. That still blows me away. We're 19 points away from each other. Um so anyway, so that's the, here's the rules of engagement. Here's how we run these things. We have the boxing theme, the rules of engagement. So we take turns. Uh, if you've never seen one of these before, Tom and I never repeat our tips. So we're always sharing every month that we do this, 10 new tips. And we also can't duplicate each other. So I only have one backup today. I've tried to make it a practice same, to have two backups. Here. Yeah. I only so, have one also. All right. And, and we've had to uh, uh, use those, I think, once each. Once uh, each, yeah. Yeah. So there's no duplicates there. Uh, the audience will do a quick round of voting afterwards, so we kind of keep track. And it's just kind of, you know, fun and short. But it's what makes this difficult is that Tom might share something from OneNote. I might share something from PowerPoint. They're apples and oranges. And yet you're voting based on the comparison of those two. No sympathy votes. Sorry, like please, Tom, no sympathy votes. He, no as sympathy much as he loaded it, front loaded the, the, this this discussion, 
Um, no, it, yeah, try to vote. I on was the, being very transparent, but yeah, yeah no sympathy votes here. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's and it might be that that you know, both of them are fantastic, but which one do you think would bring you the most immediate productivity uh, in your daily work? Um, we always say no hitting below the belt. Tom always hits below the belt because he's short. That's right. And then <laughs> fact, hashtag fact. You could Very much that. fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then winner based on overall voting, and that's how we run it. And let's go ahead and get started. So I'll kick things off. Sure. We can do, you know, each of us takes turns uh, leading in the rounds, and, and we hand off. All right, here we go. Round one. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Um, here's something short and sweet. Love this feature, though. Restoring previous versions in File Explorer. Uh, and Dang, as I I'm write glad it, I have a backup. Do you have this in yours? <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is a great – you have to admit, Tom, this is an awesome addition. Oh, it was. It is. You know, it is. So this is one of those incremental improvements. And so and as most of you are aware that previously you would have to go into like PowerPoint is a great example. You go in and be like, dang it, you know, I deleted the wrong slides on this. You'd have to open up PowerPoint, go into the version history, and find it that way, or go into SharePoint or OneDrive and go into version history that way, or talk with your admin to go in and restore a version, those kinds of things. Well, now it's just really simple in File Explorer. You just simply right-click on the document, and what opens up is the, the, the dialog box. You select the version history. And then you see the, uh, all of the edits that were made, all of the saves to that file, and go back to that last version. Just check through multiple versions uh, to find the one that you were before, before you made the mistake of deleting that essential information. Short, sweet, awesome feature. Uh, can you go back to your prior screen? Because um, I want to point out a couple things that I was trying to remember to, uh, to look at. Yeah. Um, so this only works for things that you have in OneDrive and you're syncing OneDrive locally in your file system, in your computer. The other thing to remember too is on the status column that you see there, you'll see that green check mark. That means it's actually residing both in the cloud and on your local machine. And it has to reside on your local machine for you to pull this off. Uh, if it's on the cloud only, then you would actually have to go into OneDrive via the browser the and right. do everything there. Yeah. But Thank yeah, this is a really, really cool feature that is a long time coming. And I just like it because most people still work in file shares. Yep. And if you can use Windows File Explorer or whatever the Mac equivalent is, it's a lot more straightforward rather than having to go go to the browser, find the waffle, find OneDrive, drill down, along with the appropriate weights and time for things to load, this just makes it really quick and easy to do versioning and to get what you need back so you can continue working. Yeah, and this is one of those things, again, Microsoft is doing a lot of this kind of thing where they're making these little incremental changes where you think, well, why did they change that? Or they slightly change the, the menu options around this. And a lot of it is just because it's streamlining those experiences so that, and, and this will be a recurring theme today, uh, that you can remain working in context, the environment where you are. You're not having to go do the context switching, switching between applications to get work done. Yeah, I do a weekly webcast with um, Jennifer Mason, Adam Oaks, and Tamara Bredemus. And it's a weekly uh, Microsoft 365 roadmap webcast where we discuss the new things that are coming out. And Jennifer likes to use the term, it's a delighter. It's not one of those things that's a huge enhancement, but it makes things a little easier and it delights you. And yep. those are sometimes kind of some of the coolest things out there. So, Yep. <clears throat> cool. All right. I'm going to stop Let here. Me see. Okay, good. So the first one I want to go with is surprisingly, it's a OneDrive uh, feature also. Uh, it's not going to stand up well with his, but hey. <laughs> so a lot of times when you have things in OneDrive and you're sharing them with other individuals, that's all great. But over time, especially if you've shared like folders, you may find that 
you might be sharing things that you didn't intend to share because you dropped it in a folder and you forgot that you were sharing it with the entire company or something like that. So there's a feature where you can do a OneDrive sharing report now. So you can audit your OneDrive area and see exactly what you're sharing and who you're sharing it with. So if you go into OneDrive in your browser, click the options icon up in the upper right corner, that will give you the OneDrive settings. And if you click on OneDrive settings, it gives you more settings and you click on the run sharing report. And so the first thing it does when you click on uh, run sharing report is it looks at all the files that you have in your OneDrive area and asks you to pick one that it can put the report into. In my case, I just clicked collection folder because I didn't have anything in there. Click save and really in like seconds almost, it comes through, puts a CSV file out there that when you open it, it's probably gonna open it in Excel. And what you end up getting is something that's really nice. And there's other columns here. I just clipped the ones that were uh, most pertinent, but it gives you the actual path. So here in my documents folder, Microsoft team chat files, then I've got images and stuff like that. It tells me what kind of file it is, <clears throat> what kind of permissions I've given people and who those people are that I've given it to. Also, whether it's shared internally or whether it's an external. So again, this is something that I like to recommend people do like every three to six months. Uh, more if you've got more critical information on there that you want to make sure doesn't get out. But this is a really good way to self-audit your OneDrive area and make sure that you're not making a mistake in there that would lead you to share things with people who shouldn't see stuff like financial reports and stuff like that. <laughs> so, hey, Tom, little, little question. When you uh, yeah. save down the version of the CSV, does that automatically go to a spe specified folder or does it give you the option to save it to that location? It gives you the option to save okay. somewhere okay. in there. So again, in my case, <clears throat> I could have put it anywhere there or I could have just put it at the root of what I was dealing with. Yeah. But in my case, collection folder seemed applicable for what I was doing. So it worked. Well, I'm gonna That's launch it. the I'm gonna launch the poll here for for one I, I, one other question uh, well, more of a comment of you know Microsoft is doing more especially around Teams in uh, providing these kind this kind of insights this would actually be really valuable in seeing uh, across the Teams like uh, the from the files perspective which of course can include OneDrive and SharePoint and cloud storage. So being able to, I, I, so I, maybe you know this, Tom, is there anything that's similar to that that looks at it comprehensively from the team's perspective? Or do you have to go into individual storage tools to be able to see that? Like going to SharePoint not, separately, OneDrive separately? Yeah. I'm not really sure. Um, I will have to take a look at that. I don't know. Yeah, because uh, that, cause that it, you know, it seems to me like, because that's an awesome report. I would love to see that at a team's level based on what I've added into my files and be able to go and look at that, especially um, to be able to have that level of visibility and external sharing. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Okay. All right. Uh, round one, uh, ending the poll there. If you've not voted five, four, three, two, one. All right, and the poll, and uh, I took that one 68 to 32 percent. Well deserved. All right, well you. deserved. All right, Tom. So let's go on to round, round two. two here. And guess what? Hey, look, you can hack sync OneDrive version history. <laughs> uh, we'll just go right. Past Less relevant that one now, here. Tom. <laughs> Less relevant now, yes. Uh, searching in channels and chats for Microsoft Teams. This is a really big thing that has been painfully missing from teams up into this point. And that is, you've got all these different workspaces and channels and chats, but to try to find one particular item was next to impossible unless you knew where it was already, in which case you wouldn't need to search for it to begin with. But they have now done enhanced searching in Microsoft Teams. So that makes it a whole lot easier now to find stuff. So up in the um, command bar, where normally you had to type slash something for a command, now you can just type in a uh, search term. And in this case, I wanted to find stuff that uh, 
involved my coworker, Sandra Mahan. So when I typed in her name, <clears throat> you'll see here on the left side, it gives me the option to narrow things down to messages or people or files. So we're gonna scroll through some of the options here and then there's a link at the end because there's a whole lot more than just this. But to keep up with the one minute office magic, I kind of had to narrow it down and just show you a few of the things. So when I'm sitting here at messages, I'm able to click on the from. So I can say, hey, I only wanna see messages that are from Sandra or from me. And in this case, searching for Sandra Mahan, it's like, well, you've already got those. But say I was searching for finance or something like that. I could say I only want to see things that have finance in them from Sandra Mahan. I can also specify the type. Do I want to see it from a chat only? Or do I want to see it from a channel that we have in there? And furthermore, in the filters, I can say, search for a certain subject, search a certain date range, or find a particular team that you want to search in. So in this case, I only wanted to see things from Sandra Mahan that were in our Spark Connect workspace. And you'll see now on the left-hand side, I'm only seeing results that have team Spark Connect in there. So that works out really nice to be able to find messages that are out there. You can also, if you type in a person's name like I did, you can narrow it down to people. So in this particular case, when I typed in Mahan, it gave me both Sandra's name and Sandra's test account. And then the items that are blurred out there, because I don't like to include people unless I know exactly that they'll let me do that. Uh, we had different names that weren't Mahan specifically, but they were close with maybe, you know, M-A-M something, something, something. So it gives you different names so you can be close, but you don't have to be exact, which is good. Uh, now files, finally we've got in there because you're often putting files out in Teams. If you say, I want to look at files, it's going to give you some filtering options there too. One, you can say, I only want to see files associated from a particular team and or you can also say file types. I only want to see Excel files that have Sandra Mahan involved. So when I click that, these are all files that Sandra Mahan had posted out there that I have access to in Teams. So this is a really cool feature to be able to go out, search your workspaces, find the things that you need to find without spending hours and hours and hours scrolling through endless chats to find that one little piece of information. I highly recommend using this uh, if you're doing any work with Teams at all and you need to do searches. Now, are you able to also up in the search bar, can you put in like Mahan colon like date range or, or any other attributes? Uh, I'm going to play ignorant once again, which is a real easy act for me. Um, I don't <laughs> remember if that's the case. Uh, again, yeah. I would strongly suggest uh, afterwards downloading the slides once Christian posts them out there and click on this uh, search for messages and more in Teams because that goes into great detail about all the different features you have in there. And again, I had to make this kind of brief just to fit within timeframes. But again, you can, there's a lot, you have a lot of search. Yeah. 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 A lot of power under the hood there. This is one of those kind of, they silently kind of, well, added this in. There was, there was a little bit of fanfare, but uh, yeah, they added this in there. But yeah, I mean, some really powerful stuff there. I, I, I believe that you can add those other search terms, like putting things within quotes when you're searching for a specific right term, a phrase, or a name, those kinds of things. You know, one of the things which is missing, I'm sure we, we all want to see a number of other refiners and things, but one of the obvious uh, misses as a filter would be on the tags, the new tags feature. I'm sure it's mm, yeah. coming, but um, as more and more people use that, that I want to be able to go and search on a phrase and then refine that based on certain tags and, and exactly other things. But that would be nice. Anyway, all right. I will stop sharing. So here's a simple one. Working on documents without leaving teams. And this oh, is nice. just another one of those ones that we've talked around for a long time. It's been there pretty much, to, well, not pretty much. It's been there since day one. And 
people forget about it. We get into the habits of how we work. And I, look, I'm a fan of using the desktop applications. Uh, I was just looking at this morning, I was playing with the differences uh, because I was some of the new calendar uh, adding features in Outlook for web that you, you can't do in the desktop version of it. And I, I just keep forgetting that Microsoft, as they've been saying for years now, we're going to develop for the web, for the cloud first. And when it makes sense to bring those features to the desktop, to the local applications, they'll do. And while it's, it's not entirely true with the Office productivity suite, um, we're seeing that more and more. Um, and I'm using the browser versions and the mobile versions of apps more than I am the desktop apps in a lot of cases. But here's an example of working in context of not switching between various applications. Uh, and this was, uh, I was reading an article out on the European SharePoint website, and there's a link to it within the, the slides there of some other kind of basic hidden features within Teams. And this one was just kind of a no duh moment. But when you have, if you go into your, your file tab within Teams, and you have all of the content that's been collected as part of that that team part of that that activity, um, you know, rather than um, you know, clicking and opening up and editing that in your local desktop application, you have the the various options. Where this really becomes powerful and and it has meaning there because because the reality is whether you open it on the desktop or in the browser. It's the same file, you're working on the file that exists there in Teams. You're not having to, you know, the old school way of checking the file out, editing it, checking it back in, syncing so everybody can see that file. No matter where you open that, you'll be working in the live version. If you're online and connected, of course, um, you can still do offline. It'll sync again when you're you know, back online. Um, but you can edit it straight from Teams um, there in the browser without opening up any other window, uh, and it will automatically save to that cloud location. And where this becomes powerful is really when you look at, if you've got content that is spread between your SharePoint site that's there as part of, whether it's a, a legacy SharePoint environment that you've uh, linked into Teams or it's the out-of-the-box SharePoint environment that your teams, the channel, all of the files automatically save to, or you've linked your OneDrive, or you have some other third-party cloud storage device. Um, all of those are within that file experience. Um, so, and I see from a comment somebody's making about not seeing any other options. So it depends on the environment, what do you have access into. If you go into files, um, you know, everything should be uh, within, uh, you know, Teams automatically. The, your admin does have the capability if, depending on your user license, what you have access to, whether you can get into the SharePoint environment and open it that way, or if you're restricted to opening everything within Teams. But if you are the owner of a team or a primary user of that, um, yeah, as Tom says, you may also need to make sure that you have the latest version of the Teams client. If you're using the browser version, it should be always the latest version. Um, but there, you have options as an admin to restrict what your end users can do. So there's always caveats around these things of what you have permissions to go and do. But you have that ability to, to go in and, uh, and, and like if I go and I, I can see automatically, because I'm the admin, I'm the owner of my tenant, um, I can see all the different content types, uh, and I often will go into a project. And I've talked about this in the past, where I so I have part-time uh, employees on research projects that are bringing in grad students, and I will go in and create for a research project a team and a series of channels relevant to that research project, and I will provide the tabs and the the, the all of the the links to all of the relevant tools and outside websites and partner solutions um, inside of that team. And one thing I'll do is I'll bring in, I've got my methodology in a SharePoint site. It's a legacy SharePoint site, so it's not teamified. It's not part of a team, 
but I will then link to that within the files of every new team that I create so everybody can send, access that centrally accessible um, site. And if people want to open up a file or edit within that centralized site, they do it from one place within files. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, as Jennifer says, you know, opening up the desktop app is the same as opening directly in the app. So yeah, you can, it, it's, it's great to be able to do that. It's just a, it's a slight change in thinking about how you edit and open the tools. Again, I'm, I find myself doing the same thing, going back to the, you know, opening it up locally, like there's any difference. The features are the same. It probably is more of a resource drain on my CPU cycles, opening it locally than it is in the browser for what I need to do. And so most of the interactions, the collaborations I'm doing, the editing on docs, it makes no sense to open it locally. Just open it there in the browser, do my edits, review the documents, right. add comments, get back out. <clears throat> I, I tend to like to use the client app because I like all the features, but the other day, Sandra and I were working on something and we thought, yeah, you can't do that in the browser. And we went to the browser-based version of Word. It's like, take that back. That's now apparently part of the browser-based version of Word. So it right. always pays to check it out again, just to see if they've made changes. Yeah. And, and again, they're, they're making sure that there are the, the parity is between those, those versions. And in most cases there is complete parity, if not more features in the cloud versions, the browser versions. All right. I'm going to close out the poll and Tom, 75. I, 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 I was going to say, I think you should add one to that because I know Sandra would have voted for me. <laughs> no you're not buying this are you okay no. fine go ahead all right do round three <laughs> Jump over to round three um so here is something that is more of an organizational uh view of the world and this is uh it, we we probably all heard about this um are you guys using this internally tom uh, I, I'm going to say probably not, but this is kind of outside of our little area because okay. uh, this would be more the admin type thing. So we don't get involved with the whole infosec stuff. So sure. Well, well this, this is productivity score. I'm sorry. I was thinking the security score. No, we haven't played with this. Of course, it's in private preview too. Yeah. So, so hey. in, in, and so, <laughs> yeah. And I don't know how locked down it, it is for organizations. There's a request form. I've got the link that's at the end of this if you're interested. Um, but the, I mean, it, it's all about better understanding end user adoption and engagement within your organization. And you can, of course, see within the scope. Now, let me preface this by saying that Microsoft. Um, it, this is kind of the side-by-side -side or the next step, I should say, with the My Analytics. And that's something, of course, you can go in there and see. I get my every Monday, the emails um, right. from Cortana that's sharing kind of the stats and different insights. And I, I took the suggestion way back about blocking out me time. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I, but I, I leveraged that. That feature has been fantastic to uh, block out time to actually get work done. Right. Um, versus sitting in meetings all the time. <sighs> but anyway, um, so this is kind of the <laughs> next part. Well, well, one of the things that Microsoft was very clear on, because when people saw the, the, the my analytics, some of the first questions out of the shoot were it's like, well, I want to be able to look at my five direct reports, their, their analytics, and, and I want to see who's doing what. Microsoft, Microsoft said, eh. no, that's <laughs> not the purpose of this. Hmm. And they, they said, we're, in fact, we're, we are going to provide something, which is this productivity score. We are going to provide something, but it's going to be anonymized for certain, uh, and you can't even get access to it until you have, I think it is 10 or more um, people like that, that yeah. you're looking in. So you, it, it, you cannot be used to go after and follow like one individual and what they're doing, the stalker features, <laughs> you know? Um, right. It, and so this is, so which is just great that they have that in mind. So the goal of the productivity score is to give you visibility in how your organization works, give you, provide insights of where you can improve the experiences to, to help people, and then give you those, uh, those actions. So make it actionable, give you suggestions on actions. Um, so you start to look into that, um, 
It, it goes into both employee experience, the technology experience, and provides you, as you can see, a, you know, a bunch of stats here. If you've not gone and read one of the blog posts around what's available, it's interesting, even as an end user, just to understand what's being captured and why. Sometimes that might change behaviors. If you're, well, human beings, when we understand how we're being measured, we tend to optimize towards those measurements. The Hawthorne uh, effect. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's called gaming the system. I mean, and, and look, it's it's not a bad thing necessarily. We, we all want to perform well. I guess this is another reason why with analytics, um, you know, admins, management needs to constantly be reviewing and updating, uh, uh, upgrading those those measurements because as you get more data, you learn more and you make adjustments. And so well, what they say is, you know, what gets measured gets done. So right. Um, so it's it's about getting people, make helping people to be more productive, get more engaged, um, and and fitting and changing, evolving the technology to better fit the collaboration culture of the organization. Because that's the most important thing: is that you want to. You're not just applying and force fitting technology on the organization. You want to best leverage the technology to get the most. Out, out of the tools uh, and to best fit the the organization. Um, so it's about all about optimizing that technology. So some examples, um, being able to show, it'll come back and say, well, look of all the devices, here's what's happening. The performance of devices is, is slowing down. Um, it'll then come back with some recommended actions, like here's things that you can go and do to fix. This is what the uh, the change will be, you'll even see this over in the Azure environments if you're leveraging Azure, where uh, it will go through and optimize how you're using Azure. And this is almost counterintuitive. Microsoft is providing data and recommendations, which could mean that you use fewer licenses. And they're providing this dun, dun, because dun. it's about the best experience, optimizing your experience. Because if, if Microsoft has come back and saying, you know, you're buying too many licenses, or you're never lever leveraging these other tools, you actually don't need this many of this additional license. Like you're, you've bought 100 Power BI licenses, you're only leveraging 30 of them, for example. Right. Um, so that you can save some money, you'll be a happier customer and get more out of the solution. Um, so here, here's some examples there of uh, some of the actions. Um, and uh, I'll let you read through. I've, I'm spending too much time on this, but um, <laughs> there's the link there uh, with a link to the form, the, the just aka.ms productivity score preview. So if you're interested, um, go definitely go request that and, uh, and take a look. But read more. There's a lot of information, much more in depth, and also does kind of a side by side. There's a couple different blog posts out in tech community where they talk about how this fits side by side with the my analytics and how you nice. look use both sets of data to improve collaboration inside your organization. Very cool. Yep. Looking like you've seen my video now. Okay. Uh, my third round tip <clears throat> is audience targeting in SharePoint online navigation links. Uh, really cool. They've had audience targeting for like web parts and stuff like this, but just recently they've actually rolled out site navigation audience targeting. And it actually also, after this, I found that it's also like for header and footer stuff too. But what this means is you can put links on your page that will only be seen by people who are in particular active directory groups. So to start this off, we've got a, a site here. If you go down to your left side navigation and click edit, that gives you the left side panel for navigation in edit mode. And you'll see this new option at the bottom that says enable site navigation audience targeting. You just go ahead and turn that on. And then when you turn it on and you create a new link, you still have the add a link, add the address, display the text. Now you can put up to 10 different active directory groups in there that will specify who can see that particular link. It's not security, it's just filtering. So for instance, if you had a site out there that had news for the company or something, and on the left side, you've got four different locations and you've got a link that says, link to location A, link to location B, C, D, 
you could go out there and put all four links out there, but turn on audience navigation to say only the people who are in the location A AD group will see that first link. Uh, you know, location B, they'll only see that link, so on and so forth. So you can start to personalize your page into what shows up. And we think this is really cool because a lot of times we have people going, well, they see a bunch of links, but they may not, we may not want them to see the link or the link isn't pertinent to them or stuff like that. Well, now with audience targeting, you can start to reduce the number of things that people see and make your site more streamlined to only show the things that certain people should see instead of just flooding a ton of information out there. So again, I encourage you to try it. It's a great addition in my estimation, and we're starting to use that quite frequently. Yeah, anytime you can per personalize that, that experience, uh, you're going to improve you collaboration. Yeah. All right, the poll is open. We'll let that go for a while. Yeah, you know, there's, um, I, I, I shared in uh, this other webinar that I did on Teams tips, uh, you know, talked, uh, shared a number of features, a couple of yours, a couple of mine, but around, uh, you know, navigation improvement. In fact, I think that's one that we shared in this series like a year, year and a half ago, the two-way uh, uh, connections between uh, the various environments. It's, uh, right. it's all about improving, being a streamlined navigation experience and get people to the information that's relevant to them uh, the quickest. And it's, uh, we used to have these conversations all the time in the SharePoint world about how can we simplify navigation? How can we customize the results of what people are seeing within the portal so that they're only seeing what's relevant to them. And, and it was uh, a real pain. <laughs> and it's, it's crazy though how you see usage jump up when people only see the content that's relevant to them. Yep. In the poll, Tom, 71%. Woohoo. Okay, let's see if I can close the door on you in All our right. next tip for round four. <laughs> Adding your own images to Microsoft Teams meetings. So this, I think we covered this last time, I believe. Yes. In the fact that you could use background images. And if you knew the hack, you could actually put your own images out there, but it involved drilling down about 16 levels of folders. And I was not terribly thrilled to want to let people know about that because I could see them going through and deleting the entire folder and teams didn't work and I just didn't. I, I think the community way. was pretty loud and clear to Microsoft like, hey, come on. Yeah. You're almost well, there. <laughs> well, and, the, and the thing is, when you drill down to all those folders, you saw the images that you saw by default and there was a folder in there that said downloaded images. I was like, okay, you're going to let us do it. Why don't you give us the user interface for it? Well, they finally did. So if you want to add your own images, and just remember just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. Um, you go into Teams and you click on show background images like you're used to doing if you want to add a background or if you want to show a background image. But now you'll see at the top under the words background setting, you've got an option to add new. And so this is going to do all that stuff for you that you used to have to drill down into the folder features. And so in this particular case, I went out to where I had some images stored. I took an image of the Aqaba Amphitheater in Petra because we had a wonderful vacation in Jordan this year before COVID hit. It was great. <laughs> so what happens is it goes ahead and adds that in there real quickly, and it becomes one of the options for a select selectable background. So I went ahead and selected it clicked on apply and turn on video, <clears throat> and voila, I'm coming to you live from Akaba. Um, so this is really great. You can start to customize some of your features, some of the things that mean something to you or you like as a background, but do keep in mind that there are certain limitations. You can't take a little you know, 100 by 100 icon and make it a background. That's just not gonna fly. Well, so you there's can, but it won't look good. Well, in this case, it won't even let you now. Oh, okay. If, if you try to add it, it'll say, eh, sorry, didn't meet the minimum size specifications, which are 360 by 360. Uh, even that, if you've got a large screen, that may pixelate on you, not wonderful. 
Um, conversely, maximum size 2048 by 2048. That's going to be really nice, but it's going to take a little while to load because it's probably a large image out there. You can use JPEGs, PNGs, and BMP files. Keeping in mind, BMP files are quite often really large uh, size-wise, so you may want to bring that down to a PNG or a JPEG issue, and then an aspect ratio has to be greater than four. But within those confines, they've actually made it really easy for you now to go out and start adding your own custom backgrounds. We had one meeting we were in not too long ago before they actually started allowing you to do that. And somebody had this background image that, you know, it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then they kind of came back on the camera and he had actually taped this huge picture on the back of his wall. It's like, oh gosh, we really could have helped you with that, you know? <laughs> but um, again, <laughs> I think this- All of that, just to have that, that- Oh God. Yeah. It was, it was rather humorous. I had to laugh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now you can go out there, put your own folder or put your own images out there for backgrounds on your team meetings. Uh, it's actually a nice user interface and you can do it without any chance of messing up your entire team's thing. So have at it, but just remember this is usually a business situation. So make sure that your backgrounds are appropriate. Are those all of your pictures over there on the right? Like the uh, the ones that you see there, yeah, the the Sphinx wow. and yeah. the uh, Cairo pyramids. Yeah, those wow. are all some of the pictures wow. that we took. Uh, the one there next to it was at one of the uh, marketplaces at night. Yeah. Beautiful picture. Uh, Queen Nefertiti's tomb, the jackal right above that. Oh my gosh, you would have thought those things were painted yesterday, and they're over five thousand years old. It is just unreal. Tom, I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I believe I did request that you bring back some kind of mummified creature for me, and I'm still waiting. So, yeah, yeah. I'm. Yeah, there, it, I opened the little thing, and COVID got out, and I just closed it back up, and I decided I didn't want anything to do with it. So, sorry. Christian. Yeah, I was cool. thinking of you by not opening that can of worms <laughs> or Pandora's box, as it may happen to be. <laughs> right, I'm grabbing back. Natural language queries in Excel. Ooh. So I'm a huge fan. I've talked about it several times before, the whole ideas movement that's happening within Office. Talked about you know, ideas in PowerPoint. Uh, just I absolutely love that. Um, you know, I, I don't have the, the time or the patience to go make PowerPoints look pretty. And so just to be able to dump my the images and the text into a, you know, just a, a vanilla template and it, come back with 20 different beautiful versions of it and I get to select from those and they all match. It's fantastic. When Excel, what I shared previously was ideas was basically your pathway to learning Power BI and being able to create visualization. So you, you add in your table of, of data, just you know, simple data and the example that I shared and be able to go in and, um, and select the data set uh, in your file, click on ideas, and it would automatically genu uh, generate these visualizations. Very cool. Well, there's kind of the other half of what ideas provides, um, which is the advanced query capabilities. So you can go in, there's a couple different ways. You select the data, um, so click on the, the, the sheet in, uh, in your spreadsheet, click on ideas, and the first thing, you click on the query box and it will drop down kind of suggested questions, common questions um, based on the data that you have there, including some visual visualizations. Um, you can, or you can type in using natural language about your da data, just start asking a question. What are the total sales of locks and helmets in this data set. And it will attempt to provide, using the AI capabilities, an answer as well as a visualization based on that response. And so you can select from those response types. So it's really just that simple. There's the little animation that's a little bit blurry here, but kind of shows this feature. Um, but again, just, you know, you've got your table of data, click on ideas, uh, and then just go start asking questions. It's a great way to explore your data and to see what's possible. And what's, what's cool about this as well is, is if you're, you've got this data set, you're planning to share that, rather than just creating a table format, dumping the table into a, 
uh, a, a presentation and sharing that is to get some ideas for more creative ways of sharing that same data. It, asking questions right there. You could even do that as people are asking questions about your data while you're sitting there in a meeting. You can even pose those questions into your data and see if there's anything more informative that falls out of the ideas which you can share there in a live meeting. But that's it. So there's more information about it at the link there. But uh, again, huge fan, super fan uh, of uh, what do they call super fans? Um, just fanatics. Kind of, yeah, yeah, the, I know, <laughs> fanatics. Yeah, but they, they were talking about like the super fans of like the K-pop kids. They, they call oh, them yes. like yes. stands or, or, or Stan, something. Stan, yes. Stans. Thank you, yeah. Sabra. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you, yes. Yeah, the stands. Yeah, so I'm a stand for uh, ideas. Stands. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, with that, all right, I'm going to launch round four poll. Yeah, I, I am okay. using ideas more and more. So I just was using, playing around with, a, I wasn't going to add this uh, and it was, until last week. I, you know, I've got my V next version of the slides. And as I come across it, hey, that looks cool. Let me, I'll think about that if I want to add that in for the next week or the coming month. And I'll, you know, kind of add in kind of a placeholder. Um, right. I'll, of course, I also, there's a lot of things which are not yet available that I'm just like, I want to talk about this in the future. Tom or I need to cover this, um, but it's not yet available. So I don't, you know, don't chat about it yet. And so I've got those placeholders out there. Um, like I, if you caught us last month where I fooled Tom when I, he thought I was going to talk about the lists app. <laughs> that was uh, still not available. Um, somebody just asked available. yesterday, when is that, is that available? I can't see the list app. Yeah, it's still not available. All right, uh, closing out the, this, if you've not voted, five, four, three, two, one. And we're split. So I took Ooh, that one. Ooh, two, to two. Up. All right, we wow. go to round five. Let's close this out. All right, Hopefully the you last don't take one. another one of mine because I'm in my backup now. Okay, here we go. Expanding your Outlook calendar. <laughs> okay, I'm All safe. Right, good. <laughs> Well, this is a, so this is one of those things we're talking about, um, you know, the, the online versus desktop versions. So we're talking about the cloud version of Outlook, the browser version of Outlook. There's so many new features that are coming out. Um, in fact, a lot of the, I've talked about in prior uh, episodes, the PowerPoint capabilities, like the, the, the coaching that's in PowerPoint, like that's all out there, generally available now, it's being rolled out now if you don't yet see it in your tenant. Um, but similarly, you should have this, it should be global, it's, it's all generally available, but it's expanded uh, Outlook calendar capabilities. And so this is a great way that you can go and, uh, and add other, you've always been able to add additional calendars. And if you're not using this feature, like I have, people that I, you know, personal connections, work, you know, connections to where I can have, you know, views into different calendars. But Microsoft has provided some canned experiences that are really cool. Um, not everything applies to my life, but I see where they're going with these features and I can see where this is expanded. So if you go into uh, Outlook calendar in, uh, in the browser, and go into the add calendar dialog, you'll see this new uh, experience. And down at the bottom there, you see those options where you can add in, um, you know, share this with other people, um, create a blank calendar, or you can add school, holiday, team snap, sports and TV, uh, and, and then provide feedback to Microsoft and other calendar types that you want to add. What that actually looks like. So I, I let's see if it goes, moves forward here. Um, so the different options that are that are out of the box, what those things mean. So here, for example, let's say that you're really plugged in. You have to have it on your <laughs> schedule, the must watch TV uh, part of your life. And hey, no, no judgments here. You're laughing, take into account that I did not laugh, that Tom laughed at your TV watching habits. I'm just saying. 
No, I was uh, laughing at your TV habits, my friend. <laughs> no, this is hey, this is other people. I, 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 just an example here. So you go in, you add the calendar, you select the TV. It'll ask you for your time zone, the network that you want to select from, and then all of the programs. And you then add that in. It will then add a new calendar with all of the programming, what's in the schedule. So you can go in there, then you know, add the things that you want to watch and delete the things removed from the calendar that you don't care about. But if, again, if you're trying to keep tabs on your favorite shows, for some people out there, this is, hey, this, this is an awesome thing. Um, it's, uh, of course, it doesn't have like Netflix and, and some of the other streaming services that are on there, but all the other traditional broadcast and cable networks. Here's the one that's a little more relevant, I think, to us. Um, so here, I think is important if you've got uh, uh, kids in school, is to be aware of their calendars, what's happening. Um, like I was always stymied by the fact that I could never keep track of, my kids were in, uh, when they were in elementary school, of course, they're all in college and two of them married and stuff, so they're, they're, they're old, I'm old. Um, but uh, I would always be stymied by like, what do you mean? Oh, this week, they're all half days. What's going on? Oh, it's teacher training day or whatever it was. And I'd be like, okay, so both of us are working, and yet one of us needs to now go pick up the kids at noon rather than three. And so keeping track of those schedules uh, or you know, which days were holidays. I, I have my own business, so holiday is just another working day for me. <laughs> um, keep track of all this stuff. So now I can go in. So I could go into schools, enter in my zip code, and it'll pull up in the zip code all of the schools that are in the area, select my kid's school, and it will then add that calendar. You can see on the left, the elementary school. So I've got their holiday schedule, any special events, anything that's visible there. This is fantastic. Um, the other options, I should go back here. I forgot to add this back in so that I did talk about the other options there of schools, the holidays, of course, um, national, international holidays, team snap that is for children or intramural sports leagues. So it's a specific app for tracking that. I'm not a user of that app. I don't play intramural sports. Um, but that is, I went and looked at it briefly. It's a really cool app. If you're into that stuff. Um, keeping track of that. And then your favorite, following your favorite sports teams, being aware of where they're playing, when they're playing. So that's really awesome for those people. I know my brother-in-law uh, works for Microsoft. I'm pretty sure he's not aware of this. He's one of those that has the NBA league pass. Waste mm. of money this season. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but having that capability to be able to track, I mean, pretty awesome. Uh, so, and, and why this is so important too, is that I, I live around my calendar. I mean, I have my personal time blocked out. I have my vacation schedule. I have it, as I'm mentioning at the beginning of this, I have it integrated with Calendly. So I can have, when people want to set appointments with me, I point them to that Calendly link and it automatically knows my schedule. It knows when I'm available and will go and allow anybody to go block out that time when I am free, uh, and schedule meetings with me. Um, so that is, you know, I, I live and breathe by my calendar, by Outlook still is that primary collaboration workspace. And uh, so cool. having this capability is very cool. This one out. Yeah, definitely going to check this one out. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. <clears throat> and we're actually going to do Outlook to Outlook this time. Outlook yeah. on the web. You are mentioning earlier, you know, things coming to the web before they come to the client. Yes. Um, I have actually now switched to only using Outlook on the web. Yeah. And almost everything is the same or better. Um, but one thing that I had seen that they were doing for Outlook on the mobile device that now they've actually pulled into the cloud-based, uh, web-based version, <clears throat> is that they have suggested replies available to you now. If you've used Gmail before, you're used to, you know, you start typing something in Gmail, and it tries to complete something for you or gives you a set of like three responses that you can just single click, boom, you're done. And and LinkedIn goes. does that as well. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. Um, now you have that in Outlook on the web. So I had gone ahead, taken a uh, uh, email that I had up here, and when I did reply, 
it gave me the option to say, welcome, you're welcome, no problem, whatever. Um, and so I was able just to click on that and it sent off the email with no problem whatsoever. So you're welcome, boom, off it went. But if you noticed in that first one, I like this in the fact it says, are the suggestions above helpful, yes or no? So if you've got suggestions that you're like, none of these are really adequate, or if you're working in a non-English language, you're going, um, that translation does not mean what you think it means. You could always click on no, this wasn't helpful, and then it says, please tell us why, okay or not now. And when you click on okay, it gives you the option to check box off which ones that you know bothered you for being rude or not the correct language or whatever. And you can go into a description to tell them why you don't think that was best. So I think this is really cool. And this is one of those things that I'm starting to look more and more for it now. When I had an answer like this morning, somebody sent me a request, said, does such and such occur, blah, blah, blah. And one of my things was, no, it doesn't. <laughs> but click, okay, that one's done. <laughs> Rather than having to sit down and type out the answer, which probably wouldn't have been a whole lot different, but I'm just liking the fact that you have that option. So uh, if you've got the web-based version, you should be seeing that. Um, definitely check it out. You know, one uh, of the things that I use more than anything, Tom, is like in Facebook Messenger and even over on LinkedIn is the little icon of the thumbs up. Hmm. Yes, that one's kind of cool too. I'm starting to use that more and more. Yeah, that, that's like a, uh, and I'm gonna, let me share back again really quick. But it's, uh, well, I like the thumbs up as a re auto response just because it's an acknowledgement. Like I read it, like great, no questions. There's a lot that you can kind of, you know, throw into that. Um, it, it's uh, it's a really nice to have that feature. But like you, I mean, I, in mobile, it's fantastic where mm -hmm. I'm not gonna go into a lengthy response. I might wait until I'm back at the desktop um, before I do the lengthy response. Uh, right. and so it's great having those quick and easy. Tom, you've won again. Wow, I fully well, expected your calendar one to take that one. Well, well I think uh, as far as productivity, I would disagree with you. I think that uh, yours is the winner. I would have selected yours. Well, thank it's you easy very much. Stay right now. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, I I I love that feature. It's it's great. Yeah, I use it, it every cool. day. Um, I think about it every time I use it. Like I, this is great. Um, <laughs> I like but, this one. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, for for everybody that uh, thanks for joining. Um, we don't have a date for July. Tom and I need to coordinate schedules, and we're going to try and get the next two three months uh, locked down and and let everybody know, we'll share that, that link out. So if you like the format, please come back. What I will say is that Tom and I both try to go through and add to our respective blogs all of the items that we have uh, shared out. Um, so please uh, subscribe to and follow both of our blogs. Um, this entire recording I should have out this evening, should have it out on YouTube so you can share it with team members. Um, and those that have been back and are aware that I'll also have a blog post up on buckleyplanet.com. In fact, if you go to buckleyplanet.com, up at the top, there is the productivity tips in the menu, and you can access every single one of our recordings, our previous recordings, as well as this one will be made available. And in the blog post for each of those recordings, I also break it down with a link to the specific tip. So you don't have to listen through again to 60 minutes to try and find what was Tom talking about at the 35 minute mark. Um, I provide a list of the 10 tips with a link to that time slot that, or that, uh, that, that uh, uh, timestamp in the video so you can jump to that tip as well as we provide our slides so you can download and, and get to all of that content. So lots of ways that you can consume this content after the fact. <sighs> That's a lot. And with, with that, that yeah. with that, thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you very much. Can't thanks wait to see next going. month's stats. Woo -hoo, yeah, woo -hoo. You, you, you pulled ahead a little bit more, Tom. Extend your lead. Uh, have a good one, and we will talk to you next month. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.